Blender 5.0 release candidate is now out. This is the perfect time to check out the new features it brings. Even better, download it, use it, and if you notice any bugs, report them to make the final 5.0 release better for everyone. As always on CG Dive, we'll focus on the new rigging and animation features. Let's go. Going from version 4 to 5 means that this is a major update, in which the developers can make big and breaking changes. So before we dive in, be aware that backward compatibility is not a priority in this update. So if you save a file in Blender 5, you may not be able to open it in all the Blender versions. Technically, Blender 4.5 LTS acts as a bridge, so you can save your Blender 5 file in 4.5, and then you'll be able to open it in all the Blender versions. But the safest approach, in my opinion, is to just assume that Blender 5 files will not work fully in all the Blender versions. Right off the bat, Blender 5 should feel quite familiar, yet somehow new and updated. The side panel tabs are rounder, I'm not sure if this is just a theme update, but it looks nice. You may also notice that we now have an animation tab. It is not an add-on that I enabled, and it contains the copy global transform functionality. This used to be an add-on that animators use a lot, but now it is built right into Blender. The 3D cursor now has colored axes. It may be difficult to see, but they are red, blue, and green, corresponding to the X, Y, and Z axis. This is a subtle but nice change. As I move an object, you'll see that the transform values that used to be to the left are now in the top center, which makes them easier to see. Now we'll focus on the animation editors, and you may notice some changes right away, but if you follow the development of Blender 5, you might know that at one point, the timeline was completely removed and replaced with the dope sheet. And in my opinion, that was a very bold and sensible change. But after some pushback from artists and developers, it was decided to bring the timeline back. I think the idea now is to keep simplifying it so that the timeline is a very basic animation editor, and then you have to switch to the dope sheet or graph editor for more advanced animation work. In fact, you'll notice that the king set that we used to have here in the timeline is no longer there. It's now only in a dope sheet. So let's switch to the dope sheet and see what happened there. Now, at first it may look like not much happened, but in here there is a whole new area that you can expand. That is a so-called footer, and it contains the playback buttons, the range control, the king set is here now, and playback options. By the way, I don't like it here as a footer, but I can right click and flip it to top. So the timeline used to be the only editor which had these playback options and range options, but now any animation editor will have them. The dope sheet does, the action editor also has them, even the shape key editor, and so on. The graph editor also has the same footer. Now it will be at the bottom. I like it on the top, so I'll flip it on the top. And we also have this in the nonlinear animation editor. So aside from having these buttons in every animation editor, let's see what else changed. For one thing, the king set will now be displayed in this menu here. So if I set it to location, it will say location over here, or available, and so on. Knowing exactly what you're keying can definitely be useful in animation. We also have these new jump by delta buttons. By default, it will jump exactly one second. Because my frame rate is 24 FPS, one click will move the playhead 24 frames forward or back. Now I can switch that to frames, so now this will be just a single frame, not very useful, but I can change the delta to, let's say, 5. And now it will jump 5 frames per click. I can also switch to seconds, and with a delta of 5, that will be 5 seconds. So 24 times 5 will be 120. Okay, I'll switch it back to default. Here we have a new menu for the playhead snapping. This is not really new. The functionality was added in Blender 4, so you can watch my previous update video to learn more about it. But in Blender 5, we now have a really nice menu for it. Another small update to be aware of is if I have some sort of animation, I just want a couple of keyframes that I can jump between. 
in a dope sheet, if I press the down arrow, it will actually go forward and jump to the next keyframe. And if I press up, it will go back. Until now, this used to be the other way around. And if I'm being honest, I kind of hated this change, but this change has been made for the sake of consistency with other software and with other Blender functions. We have a little update in slotted actions. If I create some material or shader actions, you'll see here that they have an icon indicating what type of action they are. Before we move on to other bigger changes, let's go to the view menu and notice that we now have render viewport preview and render play blast. Until now, these were called viewport render image and viewport render animation. Now, I don't know what caused these changes, but I think it could have been this meme. Blender 5 introduces a brand new object and bone constraint called geometry attribute. It allows you to control object or bone transforms using geometry data, and it can get especially powerful when combined with geometry nodes. That means that any effect or simulation that you can create with geo nodes, you can transfer to objects and bones. Unfortunately, my geometry node skills are limited, so for now I'll just show examples of what others have achieved with this new tool. And I'll try to cover it as soon as I understand it better. There are nice quality of life improvements in the shape keys editor. We can now select the shape keys, and we can control click to select multiple shape keys, or shift and click to select all shapes between the first one and the last one we clicked on. What this allows us to do then is to manipulate these shape keys at the same time. For example, I can Alt and click on the value of one of the shapes and that will manipulate all shapes at the same time. Or I can just manipulate one and then right click and choose copy to select it. That will copy the exact same value to the remaining shapes. I can also press X and that will delete all of the selected shape keys. X is an entirely new shortcut in this area, and another new shortcut is the F2 shortcut, and of course it will rename the active shape key, which is consistent with all other areas of Blender. Also, I can now drag and drop shapes to reorder them. Until now we had to use these up and down arrows, but now we can just drag and drop. And I can also select multiple shapes and then drag them, and that will move the whole selection. Something else that I noticed is that if I create a new shape key, it will automatically be set to one. Until now, a new shape key was always set to zero by default. And at a value of zero, if I went to sculpt mode and try to sculpt it, it will just not do anything. So having it at one by default is kind of cool, but at the same time, it can change your workflow. So keep it in mind. And the specials menu for shape keys may look quite different compared to what you know from 4.5. However, for the most part, only the names were changed, but the functionality is what you already know from previous versions. I'll try to help you make sense of the changes. New combined is the same as new shape from mix. Duplicate used to be duplicate shape key. Copy from objects is the same as transfer shape keys. New from object is the same operator as join as shapes. And update from objects already existed in 4.5. And the last two operators now also have a flipped version, which is the same as using the simple operator and then doing a flip operation. And speaking of the flip function, it used to be called mirror shape key. Lock all and unlock all are unchanged. We'll come back to make basis in a second. Apply all is the same as apply all shape keys and delete all is the same as delete all shape keys from the previous versions. Okay, now to make basis. If I have a shape key and I want to replace the basis with that shape key, I can now use the make basis operator. If we compare this to Blender 4.5, we did not have the make basis operator and the only way to make a shape key the basis was to move the shape key all the way to the top. And here is a key difference that I'm noticing. In Blender 4.5, the old basis shape key is basically empty. It won't affect the geometry at all. But in Blender 5, if I make this shape key basis, the old basis key becomes the inverted of the new basis key. So when it is enabled, we have the original shape. And if I disable it, I'll see the shape of the new basis. And another change is that you can no longer make a shape key the basis, 
by using these arrows. If I try to move key two up, it simply won't work. Nothing will happen. So the only way to make a key the basis is to use this new operator now. And this makes a lot of sense because making a shape key basis is not something that you do casually. It has to have a very specific purpose and it can be quite destructive. So the way Blender 5 is designed prevents accidental mistakes. We also have some important updates for rigging. Something that has existed for a long time is the override transform option. So without it, this control would be down here, whereas I want it to be at the chest. So I could tweak its position so it's over here, but then it appears kind of floaty and it doesn't follow the spine. And that's why we use this option. Now the control will appear exactly as we want it, without any dependency issues, but its point of rotation is still down here. And if I use a gizmo, the gizmo will also appear down there. But now we have this effect gizmo option, and it will make the gizmo appear at the override transform ball. We also have one more additional new option, use as pivot. This will make the override transform bone actually act as the pivot for this bone. Again, this can be a very powerful way to avoid dependency cycles and achieve advanced rigging mechanisms. But it has to be used carefully. For example, in this case, it breaks my setup. Effect Gizmo, on the other hand, is mostly a visual thing, so it is very safe and you can enable it without thinking too much about it. Something else that changed, if I select this whole character and press Alt and D to make a linked duplicate of this rig and character, and then I go to pose mode, I can select certain bones, and then I'll go to the other duplicate and select a different set of bones. Now, if I go to the second character, it will still have the selection that I made for this particular rig. So this may seem obvious, but it didn't work this way until now. With linked armatures, the selection of pose bones was part of the armature data itself. So whatever bones I select on this armature would be copied to the other armature. But this is no longer the case. In Blender 5, we already got a new and improved and faster FBX importer based on C++. And this importer has now become the default, and the old one based on Python is now called Legacy. Since the new importer is now considered stable, you should feel free to use it. Although, if you have specific workflows with the old FBX importer, you should use the Legacy one. And another cool quality of life improvement. Applying a lattice modifier to an object or a set of objects used to take a lot of steps. Add a lattice, set modifiers and so on. But now it is much, much easier. Let me select all objects of the head with the eyes and teeth and so on. And then I'll press Shift A, go to the lattice menu and just choose lattice deform selected. And with just one click, this gave me a lattice that deforms the selected objects. And all of the modifiers were set up for me. This covers the new rigging and animation improvements. But of course, Blender 5 brings many new features. So for the rest of the video, we'll go over the ones that might be of interest to CG Dive viewers. We have a whole new array modifier, and this time it is built on geometry nodes. The old array modifier that you know is now called Legacy. The new modifier now gives us these intuitive gizmos with which we can shape the array. We also have a circular array. This is something that Blender users have been requesting forever, and now it's here. And we have other new geometry nodes based modifiers. For example, we have scatter on surface. This is a super quick way to scatter one object on top of another. I just need to select my scatter object and it will appear on the surface. And we have different settings to control the scattering. On top of that, we can go to instances and randomize transform. This can be used on any geometry nodes instances and not just this modifier, but I can randomize the rotation create location offset, and randomize the scale. Under instances, we also have instance on elements. Now, this replaces Blender's old dupli verts or whatever it's called. 
I mean the instancing options, it was very difficult to work with. You had to select vertices or faces, and then I have to parent one object to the other. I'm never quite sure which one needs to be parented to which. Um, yeah, I can get it to work. But now it's just a matter of setting the object that will be instanced on whatever we choose here, on points, edges, or on faces. And again, we can mask it. We can even use weight painting. And on top of that, I can use the new randomized transforms to randomize the instances. Another new modifier is curve on tube. This takes a curve and gives it geometric thickness. And one of the coolest features that many people have wished for is the round caps feature. And of course, this is procedural, so I can tweak my curve and the geometry will be generated on the fly. Now, until Blender 4, selecting a shading node or a geometry nodes node and pressing H would collapse it, making it take less space. The problem was with monster nodes, they would turn into this weird oval shape. But now in Blender 5, they keep their rectangular shape. This is much easier to work with. The compositor now has an asset shelf and it comes with prepackaged nodes that you can just drag and drop into your scene. The vignette will definitely be useful. Whenever I need a vignette, I always create an image manually and then import it into Blender, but now we can just drag and drop it. There is chromatic aberration and other compositing operations that we use all the time. By the way, notice this new representation of the group node. It looks like several nodes stuck together because that is exactly what it is. So if we double click into this, we can get inside the node group and control tab brings us back out. This has always been the case, but this new look is really cool. And you'll see this not only in the compositor, but also in the shader editor and geometry nodes. And of course, there is a lot more. Many people are excited about ACES, the new color management transform. The structure of blend files has been improved and now they can store meshes with hundreds of millions of vertices. Subsurface scattering was improved and it reduces rendering artifacts. Adaptive subdivision is no longer experimental and there have been some improvements and optimizations. If you like this video, subscribe because I make an overview of the new rigging and animation features for each new release. I'll see you in the next one.